Hey. <clears throat> I didn't say anything. Whoa. Uh, Hey. Hello. Can you hear me? Um, I can hear you. Can you Wait. hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. I don't know where the others are. I had to switch rooms today because the other one has this draft problem, so it's freezing in there. But now I look, it's really pale. <coughs> <real. laughs> I want it to be less pale. Aaron. Hello. Good evening. Hello. Hello again. Hi. How are you? Hi. How are you all? Hi. Hi, Erin. Hello. I think it's the first time I've met you. Hello. Hello. Cool. <laughs> all right. So, hi, Matt. Hey, I don't have video yet. Oh, there it is. Hello. I'm oh, super pale. Oh, it's hot. Hold on. <laughs> it's on the bottom bar. I need a new freaking mic. I'm not sure where mic is. I think he's old, but he's old. Uh oh. Hmm. Yeah, <laughs> his parents are there. Windows doesn't seem to be fully loading. Are you missing um this must be hot and mic. I'm gonna try to rejoin. This isn't working. Oh my god, this is great. Do I go on the screen now? On the big screen? Or no? <laughs> this is fun. Can you guys hear me? 
Yes. Oh, Mom, did I go on the big screen now? Yes, you were just a second ago. <gasps> they fixed it! Oh my god! Oh wait, no, maybe because I'm not... Maybe it's because I'm not... Um, Hold on, what happened? Um, what's his name dropped out because his video wasn't working. Oh, okay. Ah, oh. There you go. Oh, never mind, that's me. Is it working now, Matt? Yep, I can see everybody now. I don't know what was going on. I'm just waiting on now, Mike. He's running a little late. I think we have everybody except for the host. Haha. <laughs> 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 Hold on. Did I, did, I, did I get everybody mad? Scott, Aaron, Amy. Oh, Liz is not here yet. Hold on. Like Liz Quilty? Liz Crane? Oh, my turn out tools. So what's going on, guys? Not much. We're just waiting on the host and the, the host and Liz, and then we should be publishing. We should be okay. Broadcasting. It's quiet. Too quiet. It's a little too rough. It's a little quiet in here. Are you guys excited about the show? No? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, that's good. So do you guys want to introduce yourselves? Who are you guys? Oh, and then we'll do it when we go up. When we, uh, go oh, we're going to do it on air? Uh, Sure. Or, like, that one talking is Chris. Okay. Then Matt. Uh, well, you can introduce yourself. <laughs> Hi. 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 <laughs> Hello, I'm Chris. <laughs> Hi, I'm Matt. Hello, I'm Amy, and oh good, my video came back. That was weird for a second. And I am Scott. Oh, I was calling you Chris. I'm sorry. That's fine, I go by many names. Chris is not one of them, though. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good name, though. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not down with that. <laughs> what is the bird thing? I must know what the bird thing is. It's a robot. It uses the Android ADK. Yeah, she's going to demo that one. You're going to demo that today, right? Yeah. Oh, that's going to be cool. I know. Cool. Mm. What is that making the shaking noise in the background? That. Oh, oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I can quickly, like, and easily turn it on and off, which is part of the fun part. So, yeah. Did you build that? Uh, yeah, I built the app, I built the robot. Yeah. Oh my god. What? That's awesome. Okay. <laughs> Hi, so we might not have a co-host host today, so we'll just wing this one and just ask the fine. Okay. Okay. You don't need a host or a rehearsal or anything. It'll all turn out fine. <laughs> turn out fine. It's just casual anyway. So, um, I don't know what worse this, so she might just hop in anytime. I think I heard We just don't have a list of any. Hmm? She might be caught up with um, something. Are we waiting on anybody else? Or? Yeah, we were waiting on um, Matt, Mike, and Liz, but really, we'll just call the show. I'll go ahead and start. And we're going live. 
one. Four, three, two, one. And we're live. <laughs> Hi, good evening, folks. This is Harmony Thompson, and this is Mobile Web Dev on Air. And I actually fixed it, but I go on the main screen now, which is weird. <laughs> and for our guest tonight, we have you guys want to introduce yourself? Who want to go first? Start on the left and go to the right. Hi, my name is Chris. I'm a uh, web developer and also commercial photographer, uh, video producer. And um, I'm here to uh, learn more about uh, mobile web development and also uh, get some, some tips from, from some of the, the guys that are better astute at this. Okay, thank you, Chris. Erin? Uh, okay, hi, I'm Erin, also known as the Robot Girl. and. I build Android apps, like I just built my first one a few weeks ago, and I make iOS and Mac apps, and I'm trying to learn more about Socket.io so that I can possibly make web apps that work with robots. I'm, uh, I'm Matt Center. I work for myself under the moniker of Kung Futures, and I do... Um, web app development, and then um, some mobile stuff. Uh, mostly I've done a lot of HTML5 apps uh, for mobile, but um, I'm also working on some native iPhone stuff, and i got an app I'm working on that I want to port to Android at some point, too, which I have not cracked uh, the Android SDK yet, but um, well, I have. I've installed like the, uh, the IDE for Eclipse, and that's about as far as I've gotten into that, but the I stuff I have a little more background in. Uh. I'm Scott Anderson, and uh, I am just kind of a tech enthusiast. I love everything mobile and uh, work for a marketing company, and that's my story. Okay. And we have Amy. Hi. Um, I'm Amy, and I'm sorry, something weird just happened. Oh, my, my name is Amy, and I'm a back-end engineer for Yahoo, Yahoo Sports. I'm used to like Mike <laughs> being here, but hi. So tonight uh, we're just gonna talk about a recap on Cess. If you guys have any um, feedback on like your favorite news from Cess, is our first topic. I think the my favorite tablet that was there was the IdeaPad S2 that had the dockable keyboard. Twenty hours of battery life. Yeah, was that the one from Lenovo? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that was my favorite too. It's really cool. But someone brought to my attention that there was another one that already did that, which was Acer. The Transformer Prime, but there are some that do that, but it had a really good, um, it had extra stuff on it. And for business machines, I think they just, being Lenovo, they just do better. Mm -hmm. Just, or maybe that's just brand bias, I don't know. Did they but have a skin DUI? Huh? It, was it a skin DUI? Yeah, but since it's running um, Android 4, they have to drop a regular one too. So. The, the skin UI does not look good. It's like they tried to do the Metro UI, except the metric version of the Metro UI, so it's all perfect. It's perfectly gridded every other box, and like, well, that doesn't even make any sense, though. I just really hope that they tie in the um, digital pen technology that they have on their tablet already and put that into it because then it would be perfect. Yeah. What about the uh, Android on Intel or Intel is an Android? The Medfield? Yeah. The Medfield processor, I mean, it really wasn't much. It was kind of just the first. It wasn't really anything special. I guess. Um, the phones were kind of big and clunky. Um, I don't know what manufacturers had them. Uh, was it Motorola that had it? I don't, I don't remember. I know that Motorola had a partnership with Intel um, in the future for manufacturing Intel chipsets on mobile devices. Um, From my knowledge, it wasn't anything special. It was just kind of a, a new thing. And I think they're going to 
Intel in general is going to hit the mobile market hard because uh, they are way behind and they need to make a presence now or never. Yeah, speaking of special, they really special thing for me. Not even really a SES item, but it was from last year, which was which fooled everybody, which was the camera that was really slim and thin, and it looked like an iPhone. And then it had like it had a retractable or no a, a um what is this called a lens that you can get off, take off. And it's wireless. That was really cool. But it wasn't even really. It was just a concept, um, but it's not really a legitimate device. So that was one. Um, anything else? That what do you guys think about the onslaught of uh, ultra books? Hmm. Excited or just kind of like ooh ah? Uh, we have to wait in order to see them. <laughs> Definitely a wait and see, especially in, in that market. It's one of those things where they, they're just going to try to cram as much stuff into a, a small form factor, and a lot of the, it, brings, it not only raises price, but it also brings it out of focus of a lot of um, standard users. So, What did you think about the, the other features, like the eye tracking and the um, you know, other types, like the processing power was pretty good. They demoed some pretty neat games. Um, I mean, that kind of sets it apart um, how small it is. Um, what do you think about those added extras? I don't know. It's like a wait and see game. Like Amy said, um, I'm more of a tablet person, but the Ultrabooks, I guess we'll see. The, I think <laughs> the whole eye tracking thing um, would do. It's probably better for um, for an accessibility issue. And I think it would be way more interesting to see it on not on the laptop because the screen is so small that there's very little that you can touch that you that you need to be have to look at first. See it on a television though, on especially on those really large TVs. I think that would be a way better use for it. And they also, uh, in the Ultrabooks, they also introduced the uh, Connect-like features with Windows. And uh, what did you think about those? Um, was that kind of a more wait and see? Um, or was that kind of interesting having, like, a Connect in your Ultrabook? I, I, this is the first I've ever heard of Ultrabooks. I'm looking up this stuff as you're talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> Ultrabooks are these uh, small laptops uh, that are super powerful, and uh, if you haven't heard of them, uh, there's going to be a lot of them this year. Um, yeah. Which brand was, is pushing that one? What? Every brand they're pushing them. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're trying to flood the market and make money where they can. I think it's weird that they should do... Ultrabooks, they should just focus on like tablets more than anything else. I think the reason why, because you can you can really cram way more into an Ultrabook than you can into a tablet. And the other thing is that with the hard drive shortage, it's probably easier for them to find things that are either solid state or where everything's peripheralized and they can add it later than having to stamp it in all now. That's just a little theory though. I truly think that there has to be a heavy medium between laptops and tablets, and I think the Asus Prime starts that. I mean, you have the power on the tablet when it's undocked, and then you also have the usability of it when it is docked. Um, I think that that could be further integrated and kind of a better user experience, but I think that is the ultimate solution. Um, you know, you have your ultimate tablet when you need it, and you got your laptop when you're, t you know, taking notes in, in class or, you know, typing something. Okay. So let's, let's move on to the next topic. <laughs> let's talk about um, the... Aaron, do you have anything special for us tonight? You want to go next? Uh, wait, what? 
Do you mean like talk about what we make or yeah. talk about anything? Oh, yeah, talk about anything mobile related. Really. Talk about anything mobile? Okay, well, the part that really annoys me about mobile is that like it's always glass textures. So like say on your iPhone, um, you know how like on sometimes like really nicely designed apps there's like textures and all of that stuff. Well, why is it always like you can't feel this leather texture, you can't feel like sandpaper texture because your phone is made out of glass. I find that so annoying. So yeah, you said to talk about anything. Um, I, saw, I saw something recently talking about a solution to that exact thing and I don't even begin to know where to look for the link, but there was some somebody was developing something to do exactly what you're saying of, of making a surface that would um, change depending on the texture that it was displaying, so you could actually feel um, what was going yeah, on. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I don't know where that was though. It was on Google Plus. I just don't know how long ago it was. So like, <laughs> here's an example. Like, say with sound tracking. Um, the top bar is like wood texture. It should feel like wood, not some weird glass with a wood <laughs> picture. <laughs> That's very interesting. If they could master that, that'd be uh, pretty cool. Yes, yeah. that would be amazing. <laughs> I wonder how you would have to wear gloves today. I put a link in the chat there. I think it's not the same one I saw, but it is something talking about it. Yeah, like that. Image viewing texture. Oh wow, that is so cool. Okay, so we will link it. To now, what happens if it was water? What would you feel? <laughs> That's <laughs> well, it, it already, moisture. It, it already blows my mind that you could feel rock or wood. So uh, yeah, yeah, water would. I water I would probably imagine. be like ripples. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the ripples would go with your your G sensor, and it would, you know, that'd be cool. Yeah. That'd be neat. If but I want, is there is there a practical application for that though, or is it just something cool that we could do because we can do it? Uh, uh, so yeah, exactly. Oh yeah, for, yeah, for accessibility reasons, yeah, I could see that for sure. Yeah, Braille, you could use it for. I mean, I'm sure, I think I think it would it would just be something that sets it apart, I guess. Right. I'm sure I'm sure people could come up with creative gaming things to you know. Yeah. Guess that using, texture. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, That'd be fun. Right? Did you guys see the uh, HTC Titan, the one with the 16 megapixel camera? <laughs> oh, my God. Nope. oh wait, yes no, I did. <laughs> okay, now, okay, well, what is your point of view on the megapixels? I know that they don't matter, the software has to be there in order for it to, the megapixels to shine, but where are megapixels and cameras going? Are cameras going to meet cell phones halfway? Because I know that there was an actual camera that was made on the Android platform, so that's kind of like the first jump in that sense, but where is that? Where, is, where are megapixels going from now? I saw this really uh, interesting comment on today on Tech News Today, where they were saying, "Well, when you grow that many many pixels, but you don't improve the lens yeah. or the processing, it doesn't really do anything except make the file really large. And right. since you are putting it in phone, you're you're restricted to things like memory. So you can take maybe one or two pictures before you're completely flooded out, and you cannot add or run anything else because Android still has that whole you, you're running too running too much memory issue where it starts shutting stuff down. But, but what happens if it's immediately uploaded to the cloud and it doesn't stay on your device? It would still have to stay there for yes. like a second while it's compiled, right? Well, no, yeah, yeah I, I agree. <laughs> I agree with you there, but I mean, like, you know, take a couple pictures. I mean, it's not going to take up that much more memory. I mean, if you have a 50 megabyte file, still, you know, um, if you have an with the space that's out there, it, it, you can take many pictures before, but it would right. take some time to write 
and then upload it. Well, she's talking memory, not space, um, hard drive well, space, hard disk space. Well, okay. yeah, um, actually, bo both would end up taking a hit on that, but I can't. It seems like the um, the price point would never be there, in order unless there's some serious crashes that go down for for that that sort of um, for small form memory and solid states. Like it would have to come down a lot in order for that to be practical to go to market. So this is you're you're saying that like will eight megapixel just kind of be the standard from now until a couple of years? I think yeah, I think this year and next year will still be between eight and ten pix megapixels. Okay. And again, like what Amy was saying, if the image quality doesn't improve much across the board, then it's, you still have a, a purposeless device. You know, as a photographer, I carry my, you know, HTC around all the time. It's a sensation. I th I'm not sure of the, um, the megapixels on it, but I won't lean on it in order to take a quality image because the image quality just isn't there yet. It's great for just cataloging some things and some fun photos, but... When the, when the quality gets there, or you can throw an interchangeable lens or something like that on it, then yeah, uh, it would make uh, more sense to uh, to look in that that direction for that. Now let me raise another point: Will the quality ever get there to the extent of oh, I'm going to use my phone as my main source of photography? Will that ever happen? I think someone will do it as an art project at some point too. Right. <laughs> They'll just go around for an entire year using nothing but whatever the best uh, mobile camera is instead of their. But I mean, for the for the a for the average photographer or the high end photographer, will it replace their camera? Ever? I, not not for a long time. I don't I, think I, so. It, no. It, it, would, it would take just convincing them that it, it was as good or good enough. You know. It would, okay. Right. You would have to have like lenses. The lenses are are real issues when it comes to um, camera and unless there are uh, lens providers for like mobile phones then it's going to be Which could problem. happen. It, it could happen. It's definitely possible but it's going to take a while. Before it's it a very happens. niche market. Yeah. yeah. It's really... The, uh, you, you mentioned the, cl uh, the cloud earlier. The, you know, it, we'd have to have the uh, wireless providers kind of catch up uh -huh. technology wise. So if people are going around taking that large of a photo and it's constantly saving it to the cloud and, uh, uh, you know, well, uh, they're, think they're of, capping their bandwidth and such. Yeah, but, like, think about it. The, the um, carriers don't necessarily need to catch up. Yes, it would be nice if they did, but they don't need to catch up because it's capped. Well, that's what I'm saying. They, yeah. they cap it so, you, so constantly throwing stuff to the cloud isn't viable right now because I mean, if, it's, if it's that large because they're capping stuff or, or charging you extra, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah, there is no unlimited unless you grandfathered into it. Like, um, I think Sprint's the only one left with actual unlimited, but you know, I don't. You know, Verizon's got the LTE network now, so I think they're pretty much in the lead as far as speed goes. And coverage with and LTE. Coverage, yeah. Yeah. Their yeah. markets are crazy. Okay. Um. Well. So anything else? We can move on to the next topic, or you guys want to talk about anything regarding um, what about our Google world, our Google Plus world, when all the searches are, the new searches out? Um, I'm loving it. Um, <laughs> I, I, I think it's a, it's going to go ahead. I'm sorry. I, I just wanted to mention the bickering between Twitter and Google, and uh, but you can go ahead. <laughs> Okay, well, the bickering between uh, Twitter and Facebook and all those people. Um, Google has every right to do, you know, what they're doing with uh, G uh, plus your, what is it called? Plus Google your plus, your, plus, your, plus world. your world. I, yeah, I, can't, oh I can't stand the name. I, yeah, I, wow, I don't care. Wow, it's actually called that? Yeah. yeah. Um, I, 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 I think all the other companies like, you know, Twitter and Facebook, uh, Twitter especially needs to kind of, grow up a little bit and realize, hey, um, Google made the site and they can, you know, tailor the request. If I was to circle somebody that I was interested in and they plus one links, it helps out. It helps me out a lot because all the relevant searches go to the top. I think it's awesome. It does help to find posts as well. Um, 
like I was just looking for something related to CES and a post that I had made showed up in, in the search as well, so it's a little easier that way as well. Okay. Mm, I, I haven't really seen it. It's not rolled out to me yet, so... <laughs> when I, I already turned it off. Uh, but, <laughs> but, like, between Twitter and Google, like, the whole Bitcoin thing, I... It's There's nothing that Google could have if they really wanted to crawl the public searches of Facebook, which they're also not doing. They can, it's because they it was something that they did recently, and you can't say that the deal with Twitter really sh shut the Facebook part down. It's just that they want to kind and they want to firm up their their place on the market, so they're go that's why they're pushing back on it. It's not like they can't do it. I, I truly believe that it's something to do with privacy concerns as well. Um, if my information on Twitter or Facebook is crawled, who determines if it's crawled or not? But that, all of that stuff is possible already. Yeah. They have public tools for that. Very. Uh, face, does Facebook have an open Facebook page? has it too. Yeah, Facebook, you can. Um, the thing with uh, Twitter is, like, do you even use it for search? Anybody use it for search? Sorry, I can't hear you. Do you use it for search at all? No. Twitter? Never. <laughs> it, it used to come up a lot, though, and part of me is actually kind of glad that it no longer comes up in my search. Same here. I love Twitter, but it is not information you can trust. But they came out with a statement saying it was the most relevant news. People post breaking news. Relevant, relevancy and accuracy are different. <laughs> Agreed. The thing is, I do use Twitter as a search, but I only use it to, to, use, to search for coupons. Coupons are really fast. <laughs> <laughs> and nothing else. <laughs> like, if I want to see trending topics, sure, it's like, it's a given right on the bar, right? But not um, anything else. I don't search anything else, but I use it for searching for coupons, and that's it. I but use the... I usually search for things like hashtag why I dumped my ex, or... Oh, <laughs> oh yeah, for, hash, for hashtags, it's actually good. Like, especially on um, events. When you have events, then you can follow along. It's really cool. But other than that, I don't really have But any Google Plus has that. What's that? Google Plus has that. Yes, Google Plus has that now. So that's just, you know... I wonder uh, where Google Plus is going to go from here. I, I'm also wondering that. I don't know. I think it's not going away for sure. It's definitely going to be here for a long time. But the problem is not many, especially the marketing people, are not very receptive to, receptive to Google Plus. This is what I noticed. I think it's because they've invested so much time already in Twitter and Facebook, and now there's like this new kid, and like you have to like do this whole thing and um, start over. They're really not liking that part. They're starting over and having to follow a lot of people again, have people refollow them. So I think that's why most of the marketing or SEO or marketing uh, folks are really very. Um, they're not. They're, they're really not receptive to Google Plus. Yeah, and that'll come over time. Um, what's really going to do it is the average user, um, and the average user needs to, like, you know, family members from Facebook, uh, you know, they can come over. But how do they come over if they don't know really anything about it? Um, the argument was made that, let's say somebody in my family comes to Google Plus and they have nobody circled. Um, it's going to seem like a ghost town. And why would you want to be a part of a ghost town and look at an empty stream? You know, so the suggested users, I guess, have to kind of be there and provide relevant content, as well as people need to share circles or start them out, which is kind of a pain. But I guess, you know, I think all of you guys have introduced people to Google products saying that this is really cool, any Google product, um, and kind of taught them through how to use it, and they've benefited about it. And... Uh, I think people are uneducated about the tools that are in front of them. Yes, yeah, that's, that's very true. And I think, kind of, from my perspective, they should change how you sign up to Google+. It's not really like, 
when you sign up, you like, oh, hi, you fill out your name. But the first question that you answer is, what are you interested in? It's like a big box. Like saying, like, I'm interested in, oh, hi, I'm interested in photography. Cool, you're interested in photography here? I'm going to flood you with all the photographs of, like, all the existing uh, photographers on Google+. Plus. Are you interested in development? I'm interested in mobile development. Okay, I'm going to flood you with all the... Here are the people and here are the current posts for today. Or like here are the trending topics or whatever you want to call them. And um, I think So you want them to push sparks harder. Yeah, it, it's more pushing to the user rather than having the user go look for themselves what they need to see. Like, because people don't know what they really need to see. You well, have to like just get that initial, initial block uh, but then it comes into politics on who should be in those, okay, if I like photography, who yeah. should be in there? I know. It's and, and it gets really political. I don't want to talk about politics at all. But, oh, I mean, yes. that's a heated, heated. No, no, just use algorithms to do it. Don't even, like, don't yeah. even recommend it. But this already exists in Google+. Plus. Huh? Doesn't this already exist under Google Plus Sparks? Uh, it exists under the suggested user list, but you have to look for yourself. You, you don't, like, answer a simple question of what are you interested in. Oh, just to fill out some some yeah, empty list out, information? Yeah, just fill out an initial uh, information on what you want to see on Google+. Plus, and that's it. Oh. Family, here. Here's your, oh, here's your family as we kind of know about it. Has anybody used Pinterest yet? That's an up-and-comer that is going to be acquired. I think it's a great idea. Well, they, they do something like that. They, you know, they say, well, what are you interested in? And then they give you a bunch of people that are influencers in that particular area. And so you immediately start off with stuff to look at. Yeah, yeah I think Pinterest, uh, I think Google could squash them um, with some type of bookmarking tool. Um, and that's, I, like, ultimately, Pinterest is a bookmarking site that you can, you know, make your own bookmark list and share it publicly um, and see what you're interested in or whatever. Um, but Google Plus needs to do something about that. I know that, like, I make an empty circle, and then I share to that circle, creating a bookmark, yeah. um, which is nice, but if I delete that circle, I delete all those posts, um, but it's a nice reference to go back and, and look at it. Um, they need to do something with bookmarks. They actually use that system too, where I have a circle called bookmarks, and I just put everything that I want to read. I don't use Reader anymore. I used to use Reader, <laughs> and then ever since Google Plus came out, I just wanted to be on like the stream, not go anywhere else. So I just put um, the bookmarks on uh, the, the stream itself. So I have to look. I just go to the stream circle and then find all the the links that I've plugged in there. So. That's a good idea because I was wondering the same thing. So um, I'll uh, take you guys' advice on that and create a circle for reading things later. And see, there lies the problem. People are not educated about what is going to happen, and therefore they don't know how to use the tools. I mean, that was an idea that I found from somebody that, you know, came up with an awesome idea. I think it's a great idea, but nobody's going to know about that. That's why there needs to be something implemented that is, you know, read it later, not that name because that's a company, but, um, you know, like something different. Regarding mobile, I think I remember which app that was. Um, there's read it later. There's a lot of different ones. Now, when it comes to app, like uh, being able to tell anybody what you're supposed to do next, I just downloaded something from the iTunes Store. Sorry, <laughs> Android. <laughs> oh, hi, iTunes Store. <laughs> but let's see. If you can take it off of the desktop, then it's technically mobile. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's true. Uh, Oh, it, it was Napsy. Like, it actually tells you what you should do next. Napsy? Oh, yeah, it's one of those apps. I'll, I'll look around. But go ahead. Uh, what else was the topic on that? <laughs> oh, how about the incoming stream? It's gone. <laughs> Yay. No, oh, I like yeah. it. That was my New Year's resolution. I was going to check it once a week and add somebody from it. And you I, succeeded. <laughs> <laughs> I did not like incoming stream. I, I complained about it from the very beginning. Why not? Why did you? 
I, I just, I, I got nothing in it. I got no good results in it ever. It was just complete, it was a spam bucket. It was a, here, would you like to see some spam? No, um, I don't. Actually, it's kind of, it's really more, I don't know, I really see horrible pictures on my ink up <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> then why did you like it so much? Oh, aside from that, which I can use, right? I can use that part. But I like being able to see people who followed me that I haven't followed yet. I want to check out what Your they're audience. posting about. I want to see, like, oh, cool, he's talking about something like that, or you know. And that was the only way to see that without without having to go on every profile of all the new people that followed. But that follows you, or that followed you, and it's, you know, new followers. It's more cumbersome now that you have to go and check out their profile. I know that's not asking much, but if you're going to check out like thousands or hundreds. Or if someone shares a circle and we end up with a hundred added users in a night. <laughs> well, yeah, it's, it's kind of, there was a use for it, and um, it's done now. <laughs> So not everybody's unhappy with that one, huh? No, I, I, it turned I into a real happy. stalker stream for me. Oh, really? Yeah. There, it kind of it made me actually uncomfortable to use Plus at times and post publicly because I realized, wow, a lot of these guys, eh, they're kind of creepy. <laughs> <laughs> Internet, yay. <laughs> That's my new t-shirt, Internet, yay. <laughs> No, but well, I, th I think it's better if, if somebody, if you're posting stuff and then somebody who's following you that you're not following comments and starts talking to you on a, on a particular post, then it's, it's easier to say, oh, okay, now I'm going to check out their profile and since they clearly don't just want to send me pictures from the neck down of them wearing a Speedo. Ah, um, uh, yeah. I think he's online too. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, it's getting to the point. Also, there comes a point where all of your incoming users, the number of them, become unmanageable. So I've just been, I've just been looking on like my my friends' post comments and like my comments, and it at least then you know you've actually talked to these people before, and it's a little less weird. Than the guy with neck down with the speedo. Oh, by the way, guys, if you have any questions for us here that you guys are want to talk about, like the people watching, I, um, <laughs> you can actually post your comments. So don't be afraid to post your comments, and we'll try to. I, I do check them once in a while, not often, but I do check them. So if you have any questions, go ahead and post them below. Do you have like a a dashboard of the Hangouts on Air? Does it show? Um Kind of like you stream or live stream, like how many people are watching and no, no, nothing like that. <laughs> no, not not implemented yet. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's, there's a lot of things that needs to happen with Hangouts on the hair, and we're being patient. I'm being patient, and I, I don't even know what they want to implement and how to move forward when it comes to like Hangouts on air when you're broadcasting. I'm I'm happy enough with the. Uh, being able to record it and it's available on YouTube immediately afterwards or after it's encoded. But other than that, it, like you don't have a uh, number of followers. I mean, number of watchers, viewers. viewers. You don't know how many. Um, you there's no connection between our chat and their chat. It's really right. connected. Um, to, for me to be able to see their comments, I have to refresh the post that it's on. But oh, they, okay. they did some improvements, which is really cool. Um, like right now, when I talk, the broadcaster now, when, it, when they talk, you, you go on the main screen now. Before, you have to click yourself, which I always forget. Um, you have to click yourself and able for you to be in <laughs> chat, for you to go on the screen. But now, right. yeah. So that one's cool. And then they, what did they, other things they changed? Oh. Not really by Google, but there's this plugin, a uh, really cool plugin that you can grab off of the Chrome Store where the video is. You can open it in a new tab, and the and the Hangout on Air is really like a full screen view. 
So they should actually implement that, but not right now. <laughs> or I don't know. And then, uh, oh, and you guys have screen share now, I think, right? From your end? Oh, yes, we do. Awesome. That's right? cool. Yeah, so the regular one, they, they, they released July, and you had the ability to screen share. Which is cool, especially on um, Hangouts on Air, because now you can uh, do demos. Like if you want to do demo an app from your end or anything like that, you can screen share now. It used to be just for the broadcaster. Very cool. Yep, a lot of cool changes. You guys watch uh, YouTube videos on your stream? On my stream? No, not really. I have to go to YouTube to do that. I Sadly, I still don't understand how that works. <laughs> I see the link, and then I'll start watching stuff, but I have no idea how that affects the stream itself. Oh, okay. Well, when you watch the YouTube videos, the stream uh, will just keep going, and it'll push the video away so you can't see it, mm -hmm. um, which is really annoying. There's actually a, a, an extension. Um, it's called the YouTube Plus, and you can actually put the YouTube video on the bottom left out of the stream and it'll follow, like, let's say the stream keeps posting, the YouTube video will stay stationary in the bottom left out of your view, uh, which is really nice. I think they can fix that as well. This is different than using... than just uh, being on your stream. Because when you have new incoming posts from uh, people you follow, it gets it gets pushed down. Yep. That's not only um, that's not only about videos, though. It's a lot of things. Like for example, you're resharing something, and you have the reshare box pop out, like the modal screen for the the screen for sharing. It also gets up and down, up and down, whenever um, something is um, add or something new comes up on your stream. So what I do yeah. is like I click on the I click on the top so that I go on a different page while I'm typing and like adding whatever information I needed or in or other content or analysis or whatever I want to share on regarding something that I pick to share. Oh, it's oh. 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 again. <laughs> I have a question for Aaron. Aaron's right here. Yeah. Um, I'm looking into getting into app development for Android. Um, what would you recommend that I look into, or any viewers or anybody in here, what would you recommend looking into in order to start? I would recommend getting like a phone that has the actual Google logo or Google Word on it. Uh, so like the Nexus S or the new one, <laughs> um, mainly because it's just like that one you know for sure that they test their stuff on and the updates usually come in really fast for the operating systems, so yeah, and it, it works good. Um, I have, a, I had a Samsung Galaxy Captivate and it was horrible. Like it was pretty much a dead phone before it was released. So, like, yeah, I would get uh, that type of phone. But um, not necessarily the phone, but like the app development. Uh, uh, for that, I would recommend getting familiar with Eclipse beforehand. Uh, so that way, when you click a wrong button, then you're not as confused, I guess. And um, get familiar with Logcat. That's really important. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, just in general, like the debugger is a good friend to have <laughs> for Android development. So. Um, is, is there a, an Eclipse bundle? I think there is an Eclipse bundle now with uh, yeah, um, Android well, SDK. There, there's a plug-in that you... So first they recommend uh, installing Eclipse and then 
install the SDK along with um, the Android SDK. On yeah. Right. I know. I know they they do them separately. But I, was, I was just looking at the Eclipse site because I thought that at some point they'd put together a, a prepackaged Eclipse with Android, but I don't see it on on here. I'm pretty sure you have to download it separately, but there may be some sort of plugin that auto updates for when new APIs are available. One of the uh, one of the really hard things, though, and I really struggle with this still, um, is trying to figure out the resolution sizes. So you have like low DPI, medium DPI, high DPI, extra high DPI, and just trying to figure out like the image sizes and dimensions for that and like how many pixels should be in it is really tricky and um, really it's just like if someone has issues with it you'll have to like figure out how to fix it, or you could just install lots of virtual devices and keep testing your app on them. Because yeah, you can create a bunch of different profiles in, the, in Eclipse for all the different types of devices and whether or not they have uh, external buttons and whether or not they have external keyboard or hard, hardware keyboards and all the different things that Android phones can have that you don't have in them. Um, in the Apple world, where everything's always the same in the Apple world. <laughs> you have to target all the different devices. And Eclipse, and the, the, the plugin for Eclipse does a really good job, I think, of, of, of separating those out and giving you the ability to profile each one that you want to target. Yeah, speaking of Android, they also came out with the design guide, which is really cool. Love the design guide. <laughs> yeah. Have you guys seen that? <laughs> Yeah. I, I like it and I hate it at the same time just because there are some apps that kind of stand out with their UI and it's going to be sad because all of them are going to kind of be have the same properties and you know they're not going to all have the same like if I would have download a, a, a productivity app um, and it needed certain things but not the UI that Google says, um, hopefully they won't conform to what they do just because it's more useful. Um, but I don't know. I think this is a great thing overall for you know the average user. It'll definitely make them less lost, I guess. I think it's good for developers because now you kind of have you follow this um, feel. Most the applications really are feeling. Like if you can project that feeling into the app or while you use the app, then it becomes more effective rather than just a functionality. It has to have some sort of feeling. Like you have to have like I'm happy when I'm using it or I'm excited when I'm use, when I'm using it or this is so helpful that uh, you know it has to come with a feeling plus uh, the functionality. Then you have a really really good app. Uh, if you're not familiar with the UI, I'm trying to find it, but it's supposed to be on my screen or my yeah. Android design. Try googling it, but yeah, th this is I think this is what you're talking yep, about. That's it. No, no, that's not it. Is that no, 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 it's newer than that. Is it? Yeah. Oh, okay. If you click on wait, I was just there. Here. Is it this one? It's Android. It's this one. Android design. Yep. Here, I'll I'll link it to the viewers. Um, cool. Yeah, for for people who want to see the design guides, this one right here. It kind of more follows the uh, Apple Design Guide too. Well, not really follow, but you know the same. Developers don't have to use it though. Hmm? They don't have to use it. Developers. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. So it doesn't follow. Yeah. So yeah. We feel free to ignore the Android Design Guide. Design Guide. <laughs> well, if you have like a designer on on board. On the yeah. 
But, I mean, they're going to incentivize it, and I don't know how they're going to incentivize it, but I think it will push a lot of major apps to, to use it. I think it'll be nice for the average user. I think uh, I will, you know, like it at first, but then kind of realize I'm losing functionality in some apps, but I don't know. Well, we'll see. I haven't really yeah. to, uh, in any... I mean, on any application, not, but... Oh, one of the things in the uh, new, like, design guidelines that I didn't really enjoy was now when you um, uh, tap and hold on a list item, say, in your list view, then it means now that it's, like, multi-select rather than you get a dialog box with actions in it that you can choose from, oh. which is oh, annoying yeah. because, oh. like... Say you don't want to implement multi-select, then, oh, I guess nothing really happens because you don't really have to follow the design guidelines. But it's going to be weird because in some places it will be different and in others it right. will, well, yeah. Be consistent then. Yeah. Huh, that's weird. Interesting. Um, it's Maybe they'll, they'll, they'll do something with regards to that, but we'll see. I think more people are used to, when you hold it, uh, a modal box, right? Like a new selection or a box box. Yeah. Thank you. I'm thinking with, like, my fingers. <laughs> All right, so... Like I know, I'm trying to like <laughs> mimic, uh, you know. Yep. <laughs> oh, I could show it actually. Oh, go ahead. Yes. Yeah, so, so basically, this is what normally happens when you press and hold. Um, I don't know if you could just see that. Hang on. <laughs> so, usually you press and hold, and then like this sort of thing comes up. But then now it will just be like multi-select, and then you would usually have like a button up here somewhere where you could do some sort of action with it. It's really bizarre. <laughs> yeah. I just realized that bird's a lot smaller than I thought it was. It looks it's huge. I thought it was like all, uh, spanning from a table to the top of your room or something, and then when you got it next to it, I, I realized it's. Um, it's about 10 centimeters, so, yeah. yeah. Are you going to do the demo for that? Oh, sure, yeah. yeah. So, okay, so, go ahead. Okay, so, um, yeah, this is an example of how the Android ADK can be used. So, the ADK is this uh, open accessory stuff that was released yeah. at Google I.O. last year, I guess. And um, this is what the basic board looks like. Um, it's going to be sort of hidden inside of the box with all of the wires and stuff. But uh, there is a, like the Google logo up there and stuff, so it's pretty cool. Um, and so yeah, basically you can just use your phone and it connects with the cable. Uh, which is good because, you know, uh, more reliable data and stuff. Um, and so this app that I made is sort of like a timing app where uh, every time it, like, does a tick, then it will do, like, send a message. So right now I'm just sending the message you, which means to update the RGB LED eyes. Uh -huh. um, and so there's also one like send message B every two seconds, which will flap the wings. And then of course oh. I can add in like more messages and stuff. So send message message would be um, let's say O for open beak. You can repeat that every like uh, three seconds or so. And then, so, yeah, and then now, of course, you need to add one to close the beak, so send message, uh, C for close beak, and let's repeat that every, 
four seconds about and then now it's all <laughs> nice. awesome. That's Wait, cool. How how long did it That's take fantastic. Uh, all together, uh, including the, including the robot? Uh, this robot I made in <laughs> I made it in four and a half days because it was right before the Maker Fair in New York and the Open Harbor Summit, and I wanted a portable roto robo bird, so that was sort of insane. But the app it took me about three or four weeks to make it, it work because the fun thing about it is that I made the communication persist even when the app is in the background. Awesome. So, as you can see, like it, even if you get a phone call or if you want to play uh, bouncy notes on your Android, hmm. then you can do that and the robot will keep being animated. That's awesome. That is awesome. I How is if you get a phone call? You should set up, like, if you get a phone call that... That would be brilliant. Off. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that would be so sweet. What happens if the phone goes into freezing mode? Does the app still keep going, or does it shut off at that point? The bird starts on fire. Yeah. Wait, what? What's freezing well, mode? Well, just like an older phone that just can't handle the app running in the background and a phone call plus being online. Uh, well, on an older phone, it probably wouldn't support the open accessory oh, anyway, so... Um, Not much uh, to worry. Then. Yeah. That's really cool. Really cool. Thank you. It's it's fun to like experiment with this sort of stuff. An experiment, or is it work related? Uh, I want to eventually put this onto the market, like the Android market. I make other like weird and uh, funny <laughs> Arduino apps as well. So, or apps for Arduino. So. Um, uh, just like apps that work with Arduino stuff. So, yeah, I'm just sort of like exploring lots of different ways to communicate to the hardware devices. Uh, for some reason, this interests me. So, uh, before I've done like TCP slash bonjour slash zero comp to go from an iPhone to a Mac to an Arduino which is pretty cool. And then on the Mac side, of course, it's like using like POSIX term iOS stuff, which is totally awesome, too. Mm. Um, and then I'm going to explore Bluetooth next, and then the ADB protocol, and then uh, perhaps some uh, FSK headphone jack stuff, too, which oh, is wow. have you nice. Have you seen the App Boy stuff they were doing at CES? The what? Sorry. App toy stuff. They're they they have apps specifically for where the apps interact with a toy that is sitting on top of the tablet. I posted a link on that on my plus a while ago. Let me go look for it so you can see what I'm talking about. Like using NFC. Um, I don't remember exactly what it was used, but I think so. That's cool. They've got they've got Sphero is a ball that you can control with Bluetooth yep. using your phone. Yeah. It's way overpriced though. Oh, way overpriced. It's so really cool. Yeah, oh yeah, it still is very cool. I mean, maybe maybe by June, July, if they've sold a couple hundred thousand, maybe they'll drop it down in price. Just <laughs> maybe. <laughs> I mean, oh, I'm just I'm just hoping it's one of those things that takes off for the people that have money, and the then they'll like, oh, a lot of money. Yeah. The, yeah. the Sphero is cool, but it uses Bluetooth, and mm -hmm. apparently they like did some sort of modification to the antenna to make it go like 80 feet or something. But mm, it just bugs me that like they couldn't have made it go with a different type of radio or something. Yeah, I I know that I know that Apple is using Bluetooth in the future to replace a lot of their major things. I mean, they're going with Bluetooth, what, 4 now it is? And they're, and they're yeah. saying they're going to forego NFC completely because Bluetooth 4 is going to do a lot of what NFC already does. So I don't know if that's 100% true or <laughs> how that's going to work out in the future, but that's, that's the word on the street right now. 
I, I guess we'll see. That's kind of really cool. Okay. Kind of creepy. His eyes are just glowing. yeah. I was just thinking the same thing. It's <laughs> glaring at us. <laughs> That'd be a really fun nightlight. I think there's a lot of um, things you can use to implement. I mean, a lot of ways to implement things like this, like a toy app. Yeah. I love can toys. <clears throat> Can you imagine uh, having plugs? I mean, whoa. For the, uh... Oh, my God. God. <laughs> oh, my goodness. That'd be the idea. Of get out of my Is life. it dancing? Oh, my God. Let's do the twist. I can't get oh it <laughs> I will buy three of these things. <laughs> I know. Can you use that to me? Shut up and take my money. <laughs> Cool you can just turn them on and turn them off so quickly. Yeah, I was going for an approach where like really simple behaviors create complex ones, so you can make more crazy dances that Rover can do with it oh really easily. Yeah, like, oh, that's so cool. Put that in like um, a stuff toy kind of thing, and then <laughs> I would like love to do you yeah, have to uh, make a lot of money. Yeah, it could be yeah, the next Christmas really. item for <laughs> people to fight over. Yeah. I don't know if I don't know if anybody's seen the um what's that thing called? Keep on. It's a little it, it looks like two tennis balls. So it makes it basically makes a snowman. It's voice controlled and has like vision and cameras. And the uh base model is like for teaching uh um students that, that can't learn as easily. And it's like fifty thousand dollars but they've made like a twelve dollar model that they're going to start selling around places and it looks a lot less interesting and things like that but with technology <laughs> like this you could do a lot more it seems like and, and get a lot more out of it they're already selling it and uh, people have already hacked it so I think one hack was like someone used a connect or something to dance with their keep on or make their keep on dance like they were dancing. Oh, it's really kind of cool. I think that was announced it says this last week, right? A uh, connect uh, PC version. Yeah. But you yeah, ha can't use your existing connect. You need to get a different uh, one. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you have Which to is buy a specific one for your computer. It's not. It'll be really cool for hacks. Just use the open source uh, drivers for it. I mean, yeah, it would work. The old connected at PCs, right? The old Connect. I thought they have. Yeah. But yeah, it's just like, I think you can even do it in processing. I don't know yet, because like, I don't have a Connect yet, but like, it was crazy a few months back where like, there was a contest for hacking it. And like people won like a bounty, and it was so cool. Yeah, Microsoft has been insanely embracing the ability to hack your Connect. What? At first they weren't. At no. first they were all like, "This is horrible," and then all of a sudden, when they saw it was a success, that uh, other people hacked it, then they released their SDK, and <laughs> it's sort of sketchy, but yeah. yeah amazing, but it's cool that they've done it. Yeah. People have made some fun toys out of it. Yeah, but I really like really cool. the demo. Really, really cool. I'm excited, yeah. and I hope that I can see it soon on the store, along with the play toy, yeah. or an app with dances. I'll be, I'll be watching your profile more often to see what else you create. Yeah. <laughs> That's Erin, by the way. Erin is Erin... So what, so, oh, what sort of stuff does everyone else here make? Like, what apps? Is there not gonna demo? Nothing with cool robots. Yeah. Yeah, I, don't, I just test apps. I don't make apps. It's definitely wicked. I love it. Thanks. It's very fun. I actually do mostly... Uh, Go ahead. Have a what? Well, I was going to ask if she has like a circle of, of app makers or robot app makers 
uh, it'd be really cool if we if to share it, and then we if if we could reshare it, if there's such a thing. Oh boy! So uh, <laughs> when I first started Google Plus, I put everyone into a circle called Awesome People, um, cool. and so it's about 500 people. I'm slowly organizing them <laughs> into normal circles, but yeah, I won't be done for a long time. <laughs> but never yeah. Does, never does happen because then cool. So you don't know anybody on Google Plus that does the same thing yet? No. Um, uh, yeah, there's a lot of people like. Uh, I guess that's what Google searches for. <laughs> what well, we can search some people. Know, what, is, what is the keyword for that? People that make robo robots. <laughs> You could probably type uh, robot APK or robot something. I don't know. That's a good point. Yeah, I mean, there's the search, but you, there is a keyword. Yeah. <laughs> That's why I don't know what it is. <laughs> I know the guy that ma the guys that make Sphero. A couple of them are on Google Plus, but they don't really say anything. Um, they don't really say anything on Twitter either, so I don't think it's a not using Google Plus thing. I think it's just not using social network thing more than that. <coughs> well, that was weird. Oh, yeah, she had two instances of herself. Oh, uh, of course. Sorry, my connection's been a little unreliable today. But I'm really happy that you, you, you uh, even if you disconnect, you always laugh. I love that. Mm -hmm. Uh... Anything else? What are we? What else do we have for tonight? Have you talked about uh, the search? Yeah, we did the talk search. about the search and the incoming stream being on. What else did we yeah, talk? About? That's good. Um, we didn't talk about Intel Motorola signing in. Yeah, we did. Partnership deal. Did we? Yeah, we talked about their Metro processor and. Uh, the phones, the phones that were currently released were oh, kind of clunky, um, kind of clunky. But I mean, it wasn't really anything special. I mean, no. They just need to really flood the market and prove that they can actually come back uh, mobile devices. Yeah, for sure. 2012 is going to be for Intel a proving ground, and they've kind of stated that that you know we are serious about mobile. And uh, I, I'm very interested to see if they can come up with some better chips, therefore, you know, increasing competition, which is all, you know, the more the merrier, which is going to be awesome for end users. I, I believe that CES was the um, 2012 kind of went to Intel overall. I feel like they were the uh, main shower of things at CES 2012. Every, every time somebody was like, this is our new thing. And it'll be running Intel. I was like, holy crap, how many things is in? Like, the CEO would walk onto every stage, and I was like, what is he doing here now? Does he belong here? I mean, I believe the ViewSonic had an Intel. Motorola does some Intel. I mean, computers and TVs had some Intel, I believe. So, a lot going on. <coughs> yeah, what are the main chipsets for, um, let's say, like, Google TVs in the TV, are, are those mainly the TV branded chips? Or I imagine so. I mean, they're, they're probably going to have to change shortly because, I mean, everything's going to smart everything. And a couple companies are saying, these aren't Google TVs, these are Android TVs. And it's like, wait a sec, what are we doing? Yeah. Which, I mean, they kind of already were, but... You mentioning yeah. dual-core TVs kind of leads me into saying, you know, dual-core phones right now are... Okay, um, quad core phones will be even better, um, but you mainly see it in the tablet area, um, quad core tablets, and you know the Asus Prime and things like that. Now, should people buy dual core TVs or should they wait for quad core? Because we know that they're going to come out with quad core. I I would I would I would be fine with buying a single core TV because I cannot I cannot imagine over processing anything on my television. <laughs> <laughs> That's just me personally, but I mean, the, the UI I've never looked at pretty. my TV and said, "Oh my God, this mm -hmm. needs more cores." 
Really. The only thing I, I think there will be a day that that happens, though. If somebody, yeah, I can see Microsoft connecting the Xbox with a TV. So you buy the Xbox television experience, and you'd insert your discs on the side, and it would just be a television that you could play games on. You really think they're going to take continue with discs? I mean, for as long as it takes. I think it's all going to be integrated with no discs, no nothing. You're going to have a phone or a tablet, and you're going to start it from that, and it's going to play right on your um, on your TV. You're going to connect something with Bluetooth to your tablet or phone, and you're going to play it via through your phone to the TV, and I think it's going to be processing it both. I think that's the um, a nice ecosystem that is you know wireless and very user friendly and easy. If there was a storage solution that was very nice too. That'd be nice, like not actually having storage on your device. Maybe cloud storage somehow, game saves or on live. Yeah, on lives of, of course. But you know, I don't know how that technology is um, working Without out. Without paying cool. for bandwidth, yeah, though, everyone. if you're downloading something that large. But on live is the only one that has on live right now. So yeah, and oh, I can only imagine the amount of uh, non-American people that would be. So upset because they're already upset. Well, we're, we're one of the only ones that have no data caps or fewer data caps on our on our internet. I mean, even Canada gets upset. So something on online, something like online, would just destroy their internet experience. They 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 wouldn't be able to pay rent that month. So I, mean, I think innovation needs to happen on the internet mm -hmm. side. <clears throat> Capping is bad. Innovation is good. I think, I think after SOPA fails, and I, I'm I'm saying that after SOPA fails, I think a lot of companies are going to rethink a lot of things. I think internet data caps will be one of them. Rethinking as in banishing them? Uh, probably going away. I think I think once internet users find out that they can banish SOPA by complaining enough and saying they don't like it, that they're going to go, okay, who else can we do this to in a peaceful way that will show people we actually are serious, we actually are a majority, and we're actually important. And, you know, we, we kind of are the Internet, you know, type thing. I mean, it won't happen maybe even end of 2012. It could be a couple of years down the road, but I feel like it could be something like that. Yeah, I agree. I mean... Yeah. It's not a mobile topic per se, but it is in a way. So, kind of interesting. Oh. That's the getting my 2012 predictions out early. <laughs> Excuse me. You may all see the uh, Samsung Smart Window at CES. That yeah, that TV window type thing. Yeah, yeah, that was awesome. That's one of my favorites. Cool. Yeah. Wasn't it a prototype though, and not really something that was. Well, like, they talk about mass producing them sometime this year. So I don't know. That's I was trying to figure that out. If it was just, I mean, obviously that the one that they had there worked really well. Um, but it was, you know, if you I, always try to put your best demo thing out there if you can. If I owned one that wasn't too crazy, I'd, I'd have a like a triple pane window, where it'd be the window, the real window outside, then a second window for protection. And then I'd have the television mounted as a third window. So people are like, oh, that's a really cool window. I'm like, yeah, you want to watch the news on it? And they're like, whoa, wait a second. But I don't, we'll, see, we'll see if that thing really comes out or how well it works. That, that could be a really cool thing for mobile, too, oh, because yeah. imagine just like taking it, taking your whatever you're working on on your window, just grabbing it with your phone and then, you know, or collaborating, getting with somebody, else, meeting with somebody at a Starbucks and collaborating on the window with whatever you were working on right there on the window. Starbucks mm -hmm. would love that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine that being a cool thing in the future to carry around a pane of glass, basically, <laughs> and then pull it out and play it for a while and walk away. <laughs> This is my glass. Yeah, really. What do you, what do you guys think about the uh, the water, um, the mobile devices um, being protected from water even with the battery cover off? I saw that. That was wicked. 
Sorry, now, do you think that, but that would be fantastic. Yeah, they, they did the demo where they put the phone in submerged it in water, and then they took off the battery case, and then they submerged it in water. Still working, still completely fine. Um, some type of nanotechnology coating. Um, do you think manufacturers will implement this to differentiate themselves? Or there already is one that has. The Droid Razor technically has that technology. No, it doesn't. I thought they said they did. You put that thing in the water, it's, I it's, not, it's water resistant. I, I, I could have sworn I saw that they said they had nanotechnology on it too, but maybe it's nanotechnology in a different way. Nanofibers on the, on the back of the... Okay, maybe that's what it is. Yeah. Okay. So if what, you put that thing in water, it's going to be bye-bye. <laughs> what, what I probably heard was that it had nanotechnology and then somebody referenced ahead to this thing that it already leaked or something like that. I think that's it's nano skin. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I know, uh, I know I it's thought, Kevlar, but... I thought it was the same sure. thing as the two. I'm not sure. I, I guess I got behind on that one. That's really cool, though. I feel bad sharing this, but... I did this as a punishment for my daughter before. <laughs> um, <laughs> so this, I is the <laughs> this is going to be bad. I filled the tub with water, and I grounded her, and I took her phone and threw the, the phone in the tub filled with water, right? I wanted it to completely destroy. Oh. It didn't. <laughs> it didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I for like four hours, submerged in water. And the phone. It, yeah, seriously. Yeah. Uh, the flip. The T-Mobile flip? Really? So it's not a smartphone? It's not a smartphone. It was the flip phone. This was like 2009. And, <laughs> and it was in the tub of water for like um, four hours, five hours. And then we took it off and then turned it on. Like, holy shit, it runs. <laughs> <laughs> no, there was no lesson there. I, 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 I had left my uh, old flip phone. Uh, it was Samsung, I think, uh, like six or seven years ago in my pants and threw it in the washing machine and I realized it a little too late. So I, I got it out, it was soaked, but I let it dry out and it worked fine after it was dried out. It was yeah, you don't want to turn it on when it's still wet. Yeah. yeah. And you're long, the long term effects of water is pretty bit damaging. I got I had a guy that left his phone out in the sprinklers at while getting drunk and now I'm at work and it yeah. turned it back on, it gave him a ton of errors and stuff like that and things were having problems. But then he let it dry out, and it came back on. It worked. And uh, only now is he seeing the repercussions, though. It's, it's just not doing well. It's not holding a charge. It's not getting messages correctly. It still functions basically all right, but there, every once in a while he just has an issue with it. It's like, ugh, oh, no. Oh, actually, it wasn't the flip phone. It was the sidekick. Yeah, you definitely didn't want to. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Oh, it's not the the psychic. Psychic. Actually, it's not the sidekick. Actually, it was just the sidekick. I think it was the sidekick. Is that the version? T-Mobile version? Yeah, it's the T-Mobile. Because T-Mobile made their own version of the sidekick, and I'm pretty sure they call it like the wave or the bird or something weird. The wing. The wing. So for some reason, wing? this one is waterproof. <laughs> They're waterproof. <laughs> That's crazy. That is crazy. You know, a lot of people are doing that nowadays, saying water. On the commercial, they'll say waterproof, but then when you actually open the manual up, it says water. Splash no, it says splash, splash, splash proof is what it says. Mm. Uh, so do not spill more than four drops of water. On the <laughs> now, I don't know if you've ever got water on your phone's screen and then turned it off and then turned it back on. Your phone does not perform normal until you dry it off and then pull the battery. Nope. Um, phones definitely aren't, and it definitely would be cool if they were. Uh, and be, that would be interesting technology for 2012. Yeah. For people to legitimately say, our phone is, that's all there is to it. Think about hangouts underwater. And you could use that Samsung, <laughs> yeah. that Samsung window in the rain. Only for a couple of minutes. Yeah, only for a couple. You go hang out on the air, bring your phone, and go, you know. Deep sea fishing on air. That'd be so cool. Yep. That is actually cool. That would open up a lot of things. But I don't know how cellular reception is underwater. I think uh, Verizon or AT&T would have to say, our service works underwater as well. <laughs> <laughs> 
You can go down 10 feet and still have amazing they, service. They merge with oil companies to uh, get get towers on oil rigs. That'd be cool. Yeah. Underwater. It'd be amazingly crazy. You can only imagine. It's, I mean, it works so in space, obviously, because towers are right there. Or the signal, the receiver signal, anyways, right there. Yeah. There's guys tweeting from space all the time. It's pretty funny. Are they really tweeting from space, the astronauts? Yeah, yeah. I follow a Japanese astronaut that tweets from space, from the space station quite often. What platform does he work use? Um, just Twitter. I mean, what do you mean? Twin, or internet? Or, no. um, yeah, I, I'm not all with it, but I'm a little bit with it. You mean operating system? Yes. Oh. I'm not 100% sure. Blah. You mean internet? He <laughs> uses NASA. Have you ever heard of it? It's kind of a... You know. I'm, I'm not 100% sure what he uses. But. Okay. Their robot is not agreeing with you, Mike. <laughs> He's really? laughing its wings. <laughs> freaking me out, I guess. Bird is angry. Bird is the word. Don't... That, no, that song can be in my head. Yep, sorry. Actually, there's a comment regarding SOPA. SOPA by Benwood. SOPA is forcing a lot of alternative net stuff as well. So Darknet is one of them. And then when SOPA fails, I think we will be better off having had the discussion and finding out that the Internet is vulnerable even from the United States. Or something. That's what he said. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and then... Another comment by Robert Tarbit. Tarbit. Is that how you pronounce your name? Sorry if I mispronounced it. Um, mentioned that GoDaddy has found out that their wallets are vulnerable after supporting things like soap. So it's the boycott things, like, right? But I think the really big ones that are pushing for SOPA are more of the Hollywood outfits. Um, they're more of the big supporters of SERPA. Yeah. Which is hard I to believe. I think a lot of people are going to start realizing that it's not a good idea. Um, I was actually talking with my wife earlier today, and I kind of think what happened was the guy, Emane Lamar Smith, I think his name is, probably went to a few people and was like, hey, so nobody's going to be able to pirate your stuff anymore. Is that cool? Would you be a part of that? And they were like, yeah, 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 it sounds really cool. And they were like, well, what's the rest of it? And he's like, okay, well, don't worry about it. We'll just talk about it some hearings later on, later date. Don't worry about it. And so a lot of companies just thought, okay, well, no copyright. I mean, copyrights, we can block that anytime we want. It's beautiful. And then a lot of them started realizing, wait. So if there's images on my website or videos on my website that aren't mine, they can be removed without my permission? Uh, I don't think so. I mean, Sony, EA, and Nintendo all dropped out within, you know, the, the same day. It's almost like they all got the memo the same day that it wasn't just copyright. It was a little more than that. Yeah. Yeah, I think they might have seen the example set on GoDaddy, which is a huge deal. Mm -hmm. 37,000, I mean, 37 users. Um, you know, moving away from GoDaddy and uh, <clears throat> going to registrars like uh, Namecheap. What were yeah, the other yeah, people are moving quickly. Yeah, it, it's really a huge deal when you see how much it affects your business. Well, speaking of business, how about mobile marketing? Do you guys see more of marketing moving towards mobile? I've seen a lot of the web moving towards mobile more just as a whole. Yeah. yeah. What do you mean mobile marketing? Um, more ads targeted towards mobile devices or tablets, like for example, an app. Um, oh. app for um, 99 cents or 2.99, but rather you serve uh, advertising on your, on your inside your application. What I've seen is a lot of a lot of companies having web and mobile web and app experiences. Specifically to target um, mobile users, like oh yeah, big time. I think that's the biggest. That's the biggest chunk of mobile marketing. 
Because yeah. ads don't get you anything. <laughs> not really. Yeah. Not not now. Well, sometimes they do. I mean, think of think of, think of how uh, think of how many people got. Think of how much money Angry Birds got just by somebody accidentally clicking the ad, <laughs> especially on a smaller screen phone. Yeah, try to pull the certainly pull not the as much as the people, the amount of money they're getting already. <laughs> oh, for sure. But especially when they went into that partnership with DreamWorks for Rio. And mm -hmm. I'm sure that was the first big like branded like branded game push that the either market really had. Yeah. Mobile hasn't really had something like that in that depth. I think mobile is not, is really huge in other uh parts of the world, like Asia, Europe. More yeah. so than here in the United States. I hear a lot of people say, yeah, you think our phones are nice. Go check out this phone. Go check out this phone. You know, I just got released. I'm like, whoa. When are we getting that? And they're like, oh, you're not. Or things like things like the Nokia N900, which has been out in, in you know other parts of the world for a long time. And we're just seeing the flavor of it now with the uh, Windows Phone Lumia 800. It's it's not even gonna be the same phone really. It'll be a Windows base with N nine hundred hardware from what it sounds like. Which really doesn't do a lot <laughs> considering the N nine hundred was so interesting and different. Uh, just an update to Sopa and GoDaddy. Actually, um Ben Woods mentioned that GoDaddy lost over a hundred thousand domains, which isn't that huge of a deal to them. Because like, because 32k new domains get registered every year, but the problem is if you calculate that 100,000 domains, domain registrations per year plus the ones that plus the hosting, and I guess that's where the bulk of you know the oh, problem yeah. of that is. I know I noticed they're freaking out. Um, if you go to their website now, they've re kind of designed their buy a cheap domain kind of proportion. It used to say like just kinda casually it used to say buy your domain for nine ninety nine and now it kinda st now it kinda steps out and it, and it makes sure you know that you can buy it for ninety nine nine ninety nine instead of eleven ninety nine. Plus um as as a past GoDaddy customer they send me emails all the time and I've been getting emails over time saying things like now is a perfect time to buy twenty seven percent off and the percent off gets better every month. So they're definitely hurting. Oh, every day, yeah. not every year. Did I read that every year? <laughs> Thirty-two k the most every day. Sorry. All right. Kind of wonder if they're getting as much traffic now, though. I mean, they got a lot of negative press. Two thousand eleven was not their year. I mean, a lot of people got a lot of different things. They're just the easiest. And they're the one. That gets all the TV ads and things. So, could be interesting for them. Do do they have a stance on it now? Because I know it was, we do, we might, we don't, we might, we don't know. It's the type where they say we don't, but they really do. Yeah, I'm not sure if they do or don't. Kind of interesting. But they're another company that's interestingly enough pretty integrated into mobile. They've got a mobile app and a mobile website. Makes it easier to purchase domains. I, I think we've exhausted every topic we have for tonight. Yeah, for this week. For this week. So, um, is there any questions? Um, in, do you have any questions for the group? that we can talk about or we can wrap up the show? I have a question mm -hmm. for the, the app that I'd like to build for a site that I'm working on. There's a mobile version for it which works okay, but I'd like, I'd like to have an app that pulls in the information from listed posts or posts on, on the site and show that data on a Google map. Where, What's that? Oh, I just was mentioning that's really cool. 
So that, that that would be a feature. Where what are some of the things that I can you know attack in terms of making that come to fruition? Uh, there there's some uh, programs or, or development uh, tools that are thrown out, but what's what's your feedback on that, guys? Are you making a native app um, or HTML5? I'm I'm not even sure because I haven't even started yet. But that that's the the need. And so, uh, whatever input you guys have, that would be the direction that I would go in. So you're getting the information from post data on the site. What kind of site? Uh, it's the it's a listing site for believe it or not, just regular garage sales. Uh -huh. And you want so to be able to map that using Google uh, Maps. Mm -hmm. Right. That's really cool. You should be able to do that with a simple HTML5 app and then just um, start looking at the Google of Maps API. You know, um, what's this? A good example of that. I know my Hangouts does that, where he, um, Muhammad is able to map um, the ha person hanging out from different parts of the country using Google API Hangout. Mm -hmm. So. That's an extension, though, but it's the same thing, uh, pretty much. Uh, he has it through the extension instead. But it's really doable. You can do that in simple HTML5. Um, I don't know. It, would it be possible to do that in a, in, a, in a native app like Android? or? I know people have done it before. I've seen it out there on the web. Um, there's a couple of garage sale apps already out there. Mm -hmm. um, nothing too successful and probably nothing that's been done quite well. So if you could do it well, I know a lot of uh, happy moms and dads that would be all over it. My right. mom my mom would be all over that app. She loves in the city. Ugh. Is the data already being served somehow, like through some sort of external API on the site, or is that are you going to have to create that too? Uh, the data, as in uh, where the the latitude, longitude you know, map info comes from. Yeah, we, yeah, where all the, all the garage sales are, and, yeah. Yeah, and the data you actually want to display, because or, or are you scraping? Is it? I mean, is it the site that you already work with? So it's your site that you're. Right. It, it's my okay. site. It's it's based for based on region, uh, a smaller region. So it's not scraping data from all over the country. So you're not looking at oh wow, there's a. Duras Hill in Kansas. I don't live in Kansas. Right. So th this would be information that someone would list locally and someone that lives locally will say, hey, well, let's go out today. Let's look at what's around us. And so the information that's that's there would be listed by, uh, put there by the, the person that's having the garage sale, uh, basic, which would be address. And the way that the site works now, there's already a mapping function on it now, which on a desktop you can see the location and even uh, the, the f a regular smartphone would that can render a full site would actually see the same thing. But I was thinking of kind of scaling that down to where some people like to have just a, a to download an application and run by itself and not have to go to a, a website to see that information. You can just do a mobile well, version. Yeah, it doesn't seem overly complex. You may just want to do the HTML5 route, and if you want to install, have people install it, then just phone gap it um, so that you can install it on all platforms. Um, are you familiar with phone gap? No, I'm, I'm making a note. Excuse me, making a note about that now. There's a uh, there's phone gap, and then what's the other one? Titanium. There's yeah, two. Was the other um, other uh, thing that was recommended last week? So it was Phone Gap and Titanium. I think this is part of recommended Titanium. What they do is they take um, independent. I mean, th there's some hooks in some of the common JavaScript libraries that are out there, like jQuery. has got jQuery Mobile, Cinch Touch. I use Cinch Touch a lot, um, and they uh, they have Phone Gap compatibility, I guess you'd say. But all it really means is that you can you can take your, your mobile app that you make in HTML5, phone gap gives it a, a wrapper, essentially a native wrapper um, that they can be deployed natively to each each targeted
platform that you want to deploy on. So it really is. It's just a, it's a it's a browser shell kind of thing where you're running an HTML5 app in a browser shell in a native app in a specific device. But the beauty okay. is you you only have to write it once, um, and then keep PhoneGap in mind for it. And then when you deploy it, you you've got it for all platforms. Um, but that, I was asking about the the data, getting the data out of the site because you know that's going to be one of your first things you're going to have to do is figure out how you you want to publish the data. Um, and I don't, are you familiar with RESTful services? No. REST. Um, well, it's just called REST. REST. You can just Google that, and um, it, it's a way of, of representing uh, objects using um, very simple URLs. Um, you're suggesting that he makes an API for the data. Yeah, just something really simple. Uh, just he, he, especially since he's only reading, he only needs to get you know probably one URL that has a list of the things near a particular you know location, I guess. Um, but uh, there should be some decent, and I, I would have to guess the Google Maps API for mobile would have some built-in REST support. I haven't used it, but um, I would have to guess that it has it. Um, but yeah, that. Oh, sorry. No, I was pretty much finished. <laughs> okay. Well, I've made some notes and I've, I've circled you, um, Matt. I, maybe I'll, I'll come back around and ask you some more questions as I move sure. forward. Oh, actually, all of you guys, um, about that. Sounds really cool. Uh, speaking of Sentia Touch, uh, Matt, can you give us like a brief overview of? You know, Central Touch, and also if you have an experience with jQuery Mobile. Um, I only have experience with jQuery Mobile from trying out different things, but I ended up using Central Touch instead. Um, I, I, I don't know why, honestly, other than the fact that I was just able to start pumping something out that I liked faster with Central Touch than I was with jQuery Mobile. Uh, but I like jQuery a lot in in regular websites, but the jQuery mobile at the time that I started doing stuff, I don't know, it didn't seem as polished as Cinch Touch. Um, which Cinch Touch, they've already, you know, recognized some of their own problems and have started on version 2, which had a developer preview. I don't know, actually, they might be even further along with that now. Um, but uh, when I was, I was doing the developer preview for version 2, and it was not... Not good yet. I mean, it was uh, clearly it was it's you know developer release. It's a developer preview. It's not meant to be um, <laughs> used for making production apps. But I mean, a lot of the functionality just wasn't there. So I, I'm still using one point whatever it was, one point three, one point four, something like that. So this is something that you would recommend if you're um, you know, developing an application. Please check out Sentia Touch as well. Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, if you're familiar with jQuery, because jQuery is matured too, um, but if you're, if you're familiar with jQuery, you might as well just stick with jQuery Mobile. Um, they've got a really good library now uh, of widgets and things. Um, Cinch of Touch makes a really good native-looking app. Um, I think more, I say that, but I, they have skins for Android, but it still, to me, it ends up making a better iPhone-looking app than it does make a, an Android-looking app. Um, but uh, it's a matter of personal preference, honestly. Just try them both out. It's also free as well. I know both. Uh, I know yeah. Jake Mobile is free. But uh, the special thing with Sentia Touch is if you want to uh, tr do training, then you would have to pay for the training. But otherwise, if you want to just teach yourself, um, you can look it over and it should be fine to follow through with the tutorials that they have. Yeah, they're both free to deploy on, too. Which I actually thought that, because Cinch Touch is based on EXTJS, which they've always sold commercial licenses for their toolkit, which is one reason I've never used them. Um, I always used Dojo or jQuery. But um, I, I thought they would do the same thing with Cinch Touch, but they didn't. I don't know, I think maybe to their credit that they didn't, because I probably, no, I definitely wouldn't use it if they were going to charge me to use it. So, um, yeah, but it's... It's pretty solid. I think they realize now that if you um, let your um, framework be free and then just go with like training 
where you profit over rather than uh, charging for licenses. I think it's more um, de developer friendly and more people um, go on board and use your tools rather than, you know. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it, it's it's true, especially any time I run into something that's AGPL licensed, I just I toss it out the window because, you know, under the guise of being open source and it's not really end up having to, having to pay for commercial licenses and stuff. But like anything LGPL or uh, the Apache or MIT license, things like that, um, I think developers will latch onto those. And you, uh, yeah, but the community will will build your brand for you instead of you, you know, yeah. trying to make yeah you get, get get your value out of people building your brand instead of uh, charging people money for it. Just don't mm. burn those people that develop your brand. <laughs> Huh? Just don't burn bridges with those people that develop your brand. Just embrace them and like yeah, how yeah. Microsoft is doing now with their Kinect hackers that they're embracing. Oh right, them. yeah. <laughs> Love them. <No. laughs> I think that's a good thing. Yeah. But yeah, so if you guys want to check out Sensor Touch, go for it, or uh, jQuery Mobile, either one. <laughs> and then use PhoneGap to uh, port your applications into either Android or uh, iOS. Did with they the do BlackBerry? No. Yep, yeah, they do BlackBerry. They do uh, Symbian. Um, awesome. Okay. What else? I mean, they have a bunch. Oh, they used to list it right on the front. They don't do it anymore. I swear they they change their website every week. I think mobile is really a lot of changes more than web. And mo mobile, I feel like, is forcing change for a lot of people. Yeah. They realize that people aren't logging on via web as much, so if they don't yeah. have something integrated, you're in trouble. It's really interesting because um, I do a lot of uh, uh, work for big companies that need web apps, but they're all internal apps that they need for their for various reasons. And even they, uh, giving them a web app to begin with was very foreign, you know, oh, you know, I'm not using Excel spreadsheets for this anymore, I'm going to use this web-based application to do this reporting or whatever. And you know, that kind of idea was foreign to the really large companies because they move so slowly. Um, particularly in agriculture, I have a lot of agricultural clients. So they literally 15 years behind in their technology. And you show them something like a web, a web app, and they think, it's, well, it's awesome. And then you, then you start showing them some, uh, some mobile, mobile-ified versions of those apps, and then they think it's magic. Um, and so then they start asking for more mobile apps. And I think, I think businesses, e even the ones that move slowly, are starting to realize exactly what you just said of not only, okay, like, okay, back in the 90s, they told me I had to have a website, so I got one. It was horrible, but I got one. And then now they're telling me I, not only do I need a website, but I need some kind of interactivity on that site. And not only that, I need a tablet version of that site. I need a phone version of that site. Uh, it wouldn't be bad to have a native app for that site that just does yeah. something just to help, you know, build my brand. and should be running somebody's tweets on there somewhere. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, I, I, there, there's a few companies that are really, really good at, and uh, I'm not a huge Facebook supporter, but but they definitely seem to be getting mobile a lot more. I um, would least almost start using Facebook again only on mobile. Uh, yeah, they're mobile they, apps. They've really got mobile good. comments too now, to where if you go to like TechCrunch Mobile, um, and TechCrunch uses mobile comments from Facebook, those will no longer look really stupid and ugly. Right. What I and they work now. Right. And then you'll be able to reply without, you know, your cursor going everywhere. And, and, and you, uh, bas basically what used to happen was you'd start typing words and then for some reason the cursor would just go crazy and start you typing in the middle of another word. So by the time you got done, you typed a sentence within a sentence. That looked really stupid and ugly and you frustrated. And instead of pressing delete, you actually pressed enter. So then your topic was all over the place, and it just looked stupid. So I know I had to fix a couple of mine 
by rushing to the computer a couple times. So the people even remotely understood what I was saying, and now it's even better, and they're doing a great job um, with that. There's a couple other companies out there, but I feel like Facebook and and uh, Twitter and uh, even Google are really understanding mobile really well. I, I, I hope you can follow suit. Yeah, when it comes to like creating a website when your company um, requests for something that's responsive, say it right away. Say, I want a responsive website. So that basically means that a website will cater to mobile tablets and web all at the same time. So if you're just starting out and like having your, you know, having someone redo or rebrand your website, I mean, just say, you know what, I want a responsive website, and that's it. And you kind of save a lot of um, resources because then you don't have to have like, not necessarily, especially if it's just like a simple site where you're just feeding data, right? Mm -hmm. You don't need like special native um, features like tilting or anything like that. Or games. So if you say responsive, it covers both like the mobile version, and th this is uh, just for plain data, right? Covers the mobile, the small smartphones, and then your tablets, and then your web. So, and then if you if, if you can, you can also have it um, include the Google TV version, just using yeah, one just using responsive. And don't forget the Samsung smart window. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so yeah, if you're rebranding, ask immediately. I want a responsive website. <laughs> it's all you tell the developer and the or the, the company that you're asking for, and they should be able to. Well, what websites are you guys seeing that didn't do this a year ago or two years ago that are now having these really cool things? I mean, a, apart from the obvious, what like really general websites are you seeing? I mean, my local news network as a mobile site and a mobile classified site and a mobile weather site and now they're developing apps for all of these as well and I don't I didn't even know my local weather site or uh, group knew apps that, that existed and they're, and they're developing apps for what, what do you guys notice uh, I don't know I mean that's gonna be super saturated with all apps with just for one site you mean like they're mm -hmm. branded differently like a, mm -hmm. I don't know. No, they're not completely branded differently. I mean, I mean, just like they've just got a weather app site version, uh, so that for those people that enjoy using the weather version, you know, they can go ahead and look at that. And then they've got a classified app, so that they they are all branded semi differently, but because uh, you know it's it's it can it can tend to be different users. It, it would be cool if they linked together better, but they don't. So. So they're more fragmented apps. Yeah, I don't know. I think there's some people that specifically like. I just want to see weather, you know. So you can just download that app, or I just mm. want to see sports. So you just download the sports part. I, I I think I think a lot of mobile is heading that. I think the whole industry is heading exactly what you just said toward instead of being one place that does a lot of different things. You, you, you mm. I mean, even Facebook did it, right? Facebook's got Facebook the app, and then they got the Facebook Messenger app. That's consumer response too, because uh, a lot of apps are, a lot of people release these large inclusive apps first, especially when it came to like to to uh, news outlets and content providers. They there was like, well, we have this, so we have to fit this, and it ended up with like menus that were way longer than any screen mm -hmm. can really. Um, can really offer, right? So, and then they found that a lot of people, just like she said, she's like, "Well, I just want weather. I don't want. I don't need the news stream. I don't. I don't need what this guy on the street said, and I don't need to interact with it. I just need you to tell me if I'm going to have to wear like five sweaters tomorrow or not." Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think. I think the apps that are, that do one thing and do it well are going to be the ones that. Um, and then the Angry Birds, obviously, are going to be the ones that uh, mm -hmm. succeed. Yeah, I've noticed that if you have the Facebook Messenger app, you actually get more of your Facebook messages. <laughs> I don't know if it's just a problem with the code in the original app, 
and they're working on it or what it may be, but there are two apps for it now, and it serves a purpose. And uh, I really feel like that in the future, if Facebook does go back to mobile check-ins, there will be a Facebook mobile checking app as well. You can't do mobile check-ins anymore? Um, it's just not as big of a deal on Facebook. They've kind of quietly put it to the side. It's still there, but it's not a big deal. Um, if they launch it full stream, I feel like there will be a specific app. I think it would be better off as a specific um, app by mm -hmm. itself. It was too hard to get there through the Facebook app. Yeah, plus you don't always get the cor uh, correct location. And then if you don't, it's hard to find the correct location yeah, that's on top of everything else. That's one secret with apps, mm. uh, with, especially with mobile apps. If you count how many clicks you do to get to something, and it's too many, then more than three or four, you're doing it wrong. Yeah, people don't want to do it. Yeah, if yeah. you count one, two, three, and then you have one more to do, or two more to do, you have to be able to like do it in one or two clicks. I don't mind as long as it's an important feature, but checking in via Facebook to let my friends know I'm at work is not an important feature. <laughs> So I definitely clicked through five times to do it. You it's also because there are like a ton of check-in apps, and let's face it, no one's going to be Foursquare in the space anymore. Mm -hmm. So there's because you can also add your location to tweets and uh, tweets and everything, but n the only thing anyone ever checks into is fa is into um, Foursquare. Mm -hmm. I only check into Google Plus. You, you caused me to you caused me to break out my app and see how many taps it takes to get to what I needed to do. <laughs> I didn't want it to be more than uh, three after yeah. you said that. Yeah, you, you have to be able to do it in less than three clicks. That was one of the axioms of Palm. <laughs> yeah. <A> palm? <laughs> yeah, that was the rule that the founder of Palm um, set down. Is like if it takes more than th the three tab rule, if there's more than three tabs, it's too long and you have to rebuild everything. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, was that old? I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> My touchpad does do not very many clicks to get to anywhere. The, lo the most amount of clicks I think my touchpad takes is to do factory reset the system. And, you know, I, I, I respect them for that. <laughs> oh, that's not something you want to be easy. <laughs> if it accidentally took me two clicks to reformat my system, I'd be mad. No. I think it's like five. So I have to open the app tray, get into settings, go to another app in settings, go into another section, factory reset, then they make sure I'm okay with it. So yeah, it takes quite a few. It's definitely one of the only ones you don't want. But then to get rid of an app, it's just swipe it away. See you later. I mean, that's not even a click. That's really cool. I really wish people loved oh, it, oh, WebOS more. That was fantastic. I wish somebody would buy it that was going to do something with it. Eh. Now it's just going to be on printers. I'm going to be able to swipe away what application of, uh, is printing right now. Never mind, I don't want that anymore. Okay, yeah, it's not much. I'm, I'm not thinking of what I want my printer to do that it hasn't done yet. Okay. Yeah, really. I can't think of very many printer applications. I mean, I, I want a printer that prints. That's what I want. Yeah, one that, one that gets drivers immediately for me and doesn't say you're oh. not connected to the computer. <laughs> I wanted to print my dreams. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> it hasn't done yet. Then it hasn't done yet. Wow, it hasn't done that one yet. That one. Yet. I want I it to tell me when it needs more ink. <laughs> it does, doesn't yeah. it? Mine tells me. Yeah, no, they just, like they it just sends estimated. me something. Oh. Like if it printed off something, and it's last, when it's last, <laughs> it's <laughs> last item. <laughs> right. no. I want my printer to tell me when it needs more ink. Go out and get the ink and install it itself, and then tell me when it's ready to print more. The printer is the only robot in the house. There's, more, there's the gonna be a lot of robots in the house in the near future. So. I hate printers. I think printers have just not stayed up to par with the advances in technology around it. Yeah. Print, printers aren't sure what they want to do yet. <laughs> the, the whole uh, being wireless thing. Yeah, that's nice. 
Well, not, it's mine, mine never remembers that it's connected wirelessly. Oh, okay. No, don't go yet. I mean, we're just going to wrap up now. Oh, okay. <laughs> we lost all of the topics we had for this week. So before yeah, we... Uh, exhausted them. Uh, um, I'd like... It's I'd a pretty like wicked slide. <laughs> everybody, uh, you know, it, 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 reintroduce yourself again. Just say, like, a quick how they can reach you on Google Plus or where else they can reach you, like Twitter or your website, or you can make a plug. So go for it. Who wants to start? Start on the left. I don't know, because they're all different in your screen. My screen shows Amy first. Okay, yeah, then I'll should go be. First. Uh -huh. I'll go first. Um, hi, I'm Amy. I'm a backend engineer. And, oh yeah, and I'm a mentor for Technovation Challenge. I plugged this last week, but if you live in the Bay Area, New York, or Los Angeles, and you happen to be a female engineer, I highly recommend that you do mentoring because this brings a lot more women into the, um, into the, into the technology f field. And I have a feeling that if that happens, I will yell at less people about the booth babe situation at CES. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm, hi, I'm Chris Fife. I am a commercial photographer, video producer, web developer. That's why I'm here now. And voiceover artist. Um, if you need any help with those things, you can find me on Google+, Plus, Christopher Fife. And uh, that's it. Okay, and cool. Aaron. All right, well, um, I was, I'm Erin, the robot girl, and uh, Rover will wave goodbye. Um, and <laughs> you can find me on Google Plus, uh, Aaron Robot Girl, uh, and my website is robotgirl.com. That's about it. Yeah. I gotta, I gotta follow the dancing robot. Good luck with that. I don't. <laughs> I'm Matt Center, S E N T E R, and um, I, I, I do web development under computers at computers.com. But like kung fu and computers mashed together, um, <clears throat> and uh, web development, mo web development, mobile development. Uh, a lot, I've got actually a lot of Google Plus tools um, at zipl.us. Um, if you want to check that out too, um, different things like short names, RSS feeds, just some stuff I was playing around with, and that's me. Nice. Mike. Um, I'm Mike. I came late today. I'm the other host. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. It happens. My parents brought me a new bed. Oh, uh, awesome. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's, I had to skip out for a while. That's about it, though. Yeah. Yeah, we'd like to thank everybody for coming. Thank you guys for coming. Um, thank you for uh, joining us tonight on Mobile Web Day on air. Thanks for having us. And thank you guys for watching. Those watching, uh, I don't, oh wait, there's two comments maybe. Is there? Oh, oh hi. So yes, this is actually a hangout on air. This is usually what happens in a hangout. Somebody just said that it's the first time hangout they've seen a hangout. So yeah. So thank you again, and uh, well, we hope that you would like to uh, come back. So our show again for you know hanging out with us. We don't mean to call it a show. We just call it hanging out and just talking about mobile. So mm -hmm. thanks guys. Thanks. Cool. Thank you. That does Bye. it. I'm gonna end the broadcast. <laughs> Let's go have to leave. I just <laughs> <laughs> Bye, robot. Uh, I really love your robot, by the way. Thanks. Bye. Does it have a name? Uh,